Disc 3 Sleeping only four hours a night was often cited as one of the reasons for Mrs Thatcher's success, but that night in Paris she did not sleep at all. She sat up all night talking to her devoted assistant, Cynthia Crawford, who, like the Queen's nanny, Marion Crawford, was known to all as Crawfey, but they were not related. As the night wore on, the two women drank whisky, and, as frequently happens with those in shock, Mrs Thatcher sought comfort in talking about familiar scenes from her past, her childhood, the success of her marriage, and her children. She believed she had a lot to be grateful for, but she was still reeling from the blow she had suffered, and her most depressing thought was that the man responsible, Michael Heseltine, might go on to take her job. When Mrs Thatcher returned from Paris the following day, despite her public announcement that she would continue in office, she had to decide whether it was really wise for her to enter the second round of the leadership contest. When I was standing outside the Paris Embassy, I naively imagined that Mrs Thatcher would have weighed up the situation before making a statement. But having just received the news, she was not trying to decide what she should do, merely what she had to say. One of her most loyal friends in politics, Cecil Parkinson, admitted that her announcement in Paris had come over in a rather challenging, aggressive way. It was meant to be more thoughtful, he told me, but she was under enormous pressure. She had all those grandees waiting for dinner, she was the belle of the ball, and she was going to be late. So she didn't do it well, but I'm not sure it could have been done well. John Wakeham, the Energy Secretary, was one of the advisers who planned what she should say if she failed to win on the first ballot. When I interviewed him on the terrace of the House of Lords, with the dark waters of the Thames swirling beneath us, I could not help thinking of all the political advisers who had intrigued at that place. He speaks softly and quickly, and has a well-deserved reputation as a fixer. Lord Wakeham is convinced they gave Mrs Thatcher the right advice. If she had said, I must go back and talk to my friends and consider the right thing to do, she would have been lost, he told me. The only way to try to hold the line was to say, I'm determined to go on. There were signs of panic at number 10 on the morning of Mrs Thatcher's return. When I spoke to Kenneth Clark, he remembered a tremendous flap. He was health secretary at the time, a staunch pro-European, his bluff, apparently easy-going manner, disguises a tough, unsentimental view of politics, which is nevertheless coupled with an undying passion for the subject. He told me how that morning he bluntly refused a request that he should become Mrs Thatcher's new campaign manager, no doubt with the aim of winning back some of the critics of her European policy. Mrs Thatcher could not afford another rebuff in filling this key post. She decided to call on one of her colleagues whom she knew would not refuse. John Wakeham was busy preparing for the final stages of the privatisation of the electricity industry. He took a break to watch television and had learnt that he had just been appointed Mrs Thatcher's new campaign manager. It was hardly convenient. He was about to launch the privatisation at the Cumberland Hotel, but he had no doubt where his duty lay. Mr Wakeham was not impressed by the mood he found at number 10. The people around her were not being terribly enthusiastic or helpful, he told me. The Prime Minister looked tired and anxious. He told her that there was no dishonour in being defeated, if you stood up for the things you believe in. But he warned her she would need to have the support of the majority of her MPs and her Cabinet if she decided to press on. Dennis Thatcher had been far less inhibited. Don't go on, love, he told her frankly when they met shortly after she arrived back in Downing Street. After lunch, as Mrs Thatcher left to go to the Commons to make a statement on the outcome of the Paris conference, she again chose to keep her options open. I fight on, I fight to win, she called out to the waiting journalists, and we were in no position to contradict her. Mrs Thatcher admitted later that she was not as confident as she seemed. After making her statement in the Commons, she went to the MP's tea room accompanied by Norman Tebbit. When a Prime Minister drops by in this way, it is usually to boost morale among their supporters. But on this occasion, it was her morale which needed boosting. It seemed briefly to work. Cecil Parkinson found her rather buoyed up. She told him, everybody was saying, don't worry, we're going to be behind you. But privately, Mrs Thatcher was beginning to question her own resolve. 
On her return to the Commons, she began the slow process of consulting her Cabinet colleagues, following the advice of Mr Wakeham. Mrs Thatcher's decision to consult individually with Cabinet ministers is still a subject of controversy. Norman Tebbit is in no doubt that this was a tactical error. When I spoke to him in a small interview room in the House of Lords, I could almost hear the swish of a bicycle chain as he laid into those who had brought down Mrs Thatcher. With great emphasis, Lord Tebbit explained how she should have called them and said, Right, who is going to back me and who wants me to go? The first to answer should have been an ultra-loyalist, such as Cecil Parkinson. She should have left those openly prepared to vote against her, like Kenneth Clark, right to the end. Warming to his theme, Lord Tebbit insisted, by the time she got to the rats, they would have been intimidated, and they would have said, yes, Prime Minister, of course we back you, and she would have had them. Other long-term supporters also believe that she should have called in the Cabinet and demanded collective loyalty. Lord Parkinson says Mrs Thatcher in her prime would have acted in that way. He told me, and what did Mrs Thatcher do? She said, come and see me and tell me what you think I ought to do. And that was totally out of character, totally out of character. Apart from Kenneth Clark, Lord Parkinson believes all members of the Cabinet would have fallen into line. The manner in which Mrs Thatcher left office continued to exercise leading figures in the Conservative Party for many years. Every detail of her final hours was endlessly poured over by those who were shocked by what happened. After Mrs Thatcher left Number 10, there were many who felt that she should still be Prime Minister. This enhanced her position later and increased her scope to influence events. I myself am more impressed by the importance of this afterglow than I am by the view that she could somehow have miraculously escaped from the first ballot debacle. Mrs Thatcher was not in her prime, and she could not count on the collective support of her cabinet. The cabinet were given times for their interviews. Kenneth Clark told me this was not to her advantage. It allowed the cabinet to come to an unofficial conclusion beforehand, that if she stood, she would be defeated in the second ballot, and therefore she should resign. But would they each say this when they were asked? Mr Clark, whose reputation for robustness is not misplaced, was the first to be called, and perhaps that was another mistake. Mr Clark told me he and the Prime Minister were both pretty fresh and in good form. She accused him of being defeatist. He insisted that she should accept that her cause was hopeless. Any attempt to go into the second ballot would be like the charge of the Light Brigade. Mr Clark did not end his assessment there. He said she should release John Major and Douglas Hurd from their undertakings to support her, they had signed her nomination papers, so they could stand for the leadership themselves. Mrs Thatcher later described his approach as brutalist. When Mr Clark talked to the rest of the Cabinet, he says that there were a whole lot of eyes looking at me and lots of breathless requests for him to reveal what he had said. He was characteristically open and he helped create a mood which carried through into individual meetings with the Prime Minister. Michael Howard told her he had doubts about whether she could win, although he pledged to campaign vigorously on her behalf. Even the irrepressible Alan Clark was pessimistic about her ability to continue, but he urged her to have a try anyway. What a way to go, enthused the impractical diarist, unbeaten in three elections, never rejected by the people, brought down by non-entities. One of the most poignant descriptions of the way Mrs Thatcher responded to the dire news from the Cabinet is provided by John Gummer, who had disagreed with her on some issues, particularly Europe. He'd worked closely with her as a speechwriter as well as a senior minister, and he was fond of her. Like most of the others, he told her she could not win. I spoke to him in his Queen Anne's Gate office, which was being done up. It was appropriate that we were talking in a room only partly cleared of the mess left by the builders. Everything seemed to be in the wrong place, as it had been on that turbulent day in November 1990. Mr Gummer became emotional in describing how Mrs Thatcher had responded to the reaction of her cabinet. He told me she looked deflated in a way which I hadn't ever seen before. I'd seen her angry, and I'd seen her fed up, but never like that. There was a smallness about her. She looked different, and that was quite hard to take. Some of those who saw her later in the evening were convinced that she had been crying. There is no doubt she felt betrayed, and it was a feeling that would grow as the years went on.
as the rumours spread that Mrs Thatcher would resign, one of her most loyal junior ministers, Michael Portillo, made a desperate attempt to persuade her to stay on. Mr Portillo told me he argued with Mrs Thatcher that she would be in a much stronger position in the second round because she would be able to talk to her MPs. You haven't spoken to any of them, he remembers saying to her. You haven't actually campaigned at all. Mr Portillo continues, She looked at me as though I had revealed a great truth to her, as though she had never thought of this. She looked shocked. Mr Portillo believes it was beneath her dignity to canvass support, but he also agrees with Lord Parkinson and Sir Bernard Ingham that there was something strange about the way she had not put up a proper fight in the first round. The most unexpected encounter Mrs Thatcher had on the eve of the announcement of her resignation was with a Labour MP. The member for Birkenhead, the independent-minded Frank Field, had been impressed by the way she had dealt with him on a non-partisan basis over some of the problems affecting his constituency, particularly those involving the Camel Laird shipyard. It is not difficult to see why Mrs Thatcher agreed to talk to Mr Field. A committed Christian and high-minded thinker, Mr Field could be counted on to tell the truth as he saw it. Mrs Thatcher would have been intrigued about the line he might take, and Mr Field would know that she would keep their meeting secret. Consorting with the enemy at her time of need would not have gone down well in Labour circles. Mr Field told me he wanted to see her as a sign of personal friendship. She was wonderful to deal with, he said. If she agreed something should happen, it did happen. She would write a prime ministerial minute. This curious cross-party relationship was strong enough to give Mr Field access to Mrs Thatcher at the most vulnerable moment in her career. In spite of the danger of being caught on camera walking up Downing Street, he had asked to see her at number 10, and the request had been granted. News of the meeting never leaked out. The conversation they had, related to me by Mr Field, gives a remarkable insight into her thinking at this pivotal point in British politics. Mr Field strongly advised the Prime Minister that she should resign. He says her mood was fragile, but she was as courteous as ever. You can't go out on a top note, but you can go out on a high note, he told her. Mrs Thatcher, he says, agreed with him, but when Mr Field suggested her work might be cut out to stop Mr Heseltine becoming the next leader, she was rather restrained. He's a very bad man, Frank, she told him. Mr Field was amused by the thought that perhaps she believed it was not right for him to be exposed to any stronger language. Then they moved on to discuss the vital question, who she might support in the coming leadership election. I said, you should get your candidate into the ring tonight. And she said, who is my candidate? I said, it's John Major, surely. And she said, John Major? He's very young. And then after a pause, she said, why do you say John Major, Frank? And I said, he was the first of the 1979 intake. He's surely your candidate. Mr Field was pointing out that of all the MPs who had been elected when Mrs Thatcher came to power, Mr Major had become the most prominent. Mrs Thatcher gave the impression she was not convinced Mr Major was the obvious choice, but she made no further comment. It was yet one more sign that the Prime Minister did not have a master plan. She could not think much beyond the awful decision she now knew she had to take. It had been a devastating day. But she was not entirely wrapped up in her own problems. She suggested to Mr Field that perhaps it would be wise if he left number 10 by the back door. When Margaret Thatcher announced her resignation at 9.33am on November 22, 1990, the whole world took notice. In the blizzard of comment which followed from Washington to Beijing, no one doubted that she was the most significant British political figure since Winston Churchill. But commentators were also quick to point out that she sharply divided the nation. Unlike most political leaders, she seemed to go out of her way to create controversy, and only a small minority of the population were indifferent to her arguments. One of the routine tests for insanity, can you name the Prime Minister, had to be abandoned because even the mentally ill appeared to have no difficulty in recalling her name. When the Cabinet gathered that morning in Downing Street, most of them were not sure whether she would resign. Kenneth Clark was among those concerned that she might ignore his advice. I have a very high embarrassment threshold, he warned John Wakeham, making it clear he would make an embarrassing fuss if she did not resign. 
I was in a routine news meeting at the BBC Television Centre at White City. Well, I was asked, will she go? The truthful answer would be that I had no idea. After three astonishing days, I felt battered by events and in the perfect world would have liked the day off. But after 20 years as a BBC reporter and having risen to the post of chief political correspondent, I knew something more positive was required. I think she'll fight on, I said. For years, my professional life had been dominated by Mrs Thatcher. I found it very difficult to accept that her time at number 10 was about to end. As I finished my explanation to my journalist colleagues of why she would stay, I was immediately contradicted by the loudspeaker announcement that she would go, and such was the impact of this news that my embarrassment was short-lived. It was decided that BBC One should now switch to what was called a rolling news operation presented by Nicholas Witchell, and for the next couple of hours I sat in the studio trying to make sense of the unfolding drama. Inside the cabinet room the atmosphere was heavy with emotion. The Prime Minister found it impossible to hold back her tears. She broke down three times as she tried to read her formal statement. Having consulted widely among my colleagues, she said, I have concluded that the unity of the party and the prospects of victory in a general election would be better served if I stood down to enable Cabinet colleagues to enter the ballot for the leadership. I should like to thank all those in the Cabinet and outside who have given me such dedicated support. She would dearly like it to have been a dignified occasion, but she was too upset and in a state of shock. She felt betrayed by a disloyal cabinet and by malign forces within the Conservative Party led by Michael Heseltine, who had dared to stand against her. One of those present recorded that three cabinet ministers had also been in tears. The rest stared down at the table, the guiltiest stared down hardest. The only hint we received at Television Centre of her real emotions was a report which came from Bernard Ingham that she had told her colleagues it's a funny old world. Given her legendary lack of humour, I took this to mean she thought the whole process unfair. One of those who attended Cabinet that morning told me she'd not used the phrase then, she'd used it several times when she'd spoken to members of the Cabinet the evening before. It was her concluding point, following a list of reasons for staying on. She had won three general elections, retained the overwhelming support of the party, had never lost a motion of confidence, and indeed had won majority support from Conservative MPs in the first round of the leadership elections. In exasperation, she said, it's a funny old world. But she did not, of course, think it was remotely funny. During the previous week, I had prepared a detailed political obituary, just in case, and this was now broadcast. Looking back, it is a remarkably cool appraisal. Mrs Thatcher has gained much in public esteem in the years since she left office. But at the time, Labour were well ahead in the opinion polls, the economy was on the edge of recession, and the annual rate of inflation was just over 10%. The triumphs of Thatcherism, the historic shift to freer markets, privatisation, and the curbing of union power, all seem to have lost their shine. Since the general election landslide of 1987, she had lost two of her most important allies, Nigel Lawson and Sir Geoffrey Howe. She had introduced the disastrous poll tax, and the party split over Europe had widened, leaving her in a minority within the cabinet. Outside the political world, the reaction was often extreme. A man was spotted on a London bus opening a bottle of champagne. A member of the crowd behind the gates of Downing Street started to shout, Maggie, 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 gone, gone, gone. But across the country, among the many Conservative Party activists who had taken no part in these dramatic events, there was a deep sense of anger. Their feelings about the way their revered leader had been unceremoniously dumped would become a potent force in the coming years and would have a crucial effect on British politics. But on the day, their mood was perhaps best expressed by the woman who turned up at the Conservative headquarters in Mrs Thatcher's Finchley constituency, asking if there was a book to sign. At a time of mourning, what else would one expect but a book of condolences? Among the comedians and satirists who'd enjoyed boom years under her premiership, there was a rueful recognition that, however much they had tried to undermine Mrs Thatcher, it was members of her own party who had finally succeeded in removing her from office. The editor of Private Eye, Ian Hislop, 
would conceive that it demonstrated the limitations of satire. Earlier in the year, the Guardian had run a competition for the words people would like to see on her memorial stone, and the winners were republished. Licensed for dancing was one of the more cheerfully disrespectful. A more subtle suggestion alluded to the way Mrs. Thatcher had brought commercial values into public life. To read epitaph, insert 15 pence. It is worth remembering the uniqueness of this event. No Prime Minister had ever been forced to resign as a result of doing badly in a vote of their party's MPs. No Prime Minister had so little control of the timing of their resignation announcement. Nominations for the second ballot were due to close at noon that day. If Mrs Thatcher was going to allow others to enter the contest, she had to announce her decision well before noon. Her original application to take part, nominated by her Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd and her Chancellor John Major, had only been signed by them the day before. In a glorious twist, worthy of one of his own improbable plots, it was a driver employed by Geoffrey Archer who picked up the completed form at Mr Major's house in Huntingdonshire the evening before. The novelist's driver waited two hours so that a second, far more secret document could be taken back to London as well. This was Mr Major's own application to take part in the leadership election if Mrs Thatcher backed out. What we did not know then, of course, was that Mr Major had quite recently had an affair with the prominent Tory MP Edwina Curry, and if that had been public knowledge, he would almost certainly not have been contemplating a leadership bid. It is not the only intriguing what-if scenario. Had we known that Mr Archer, later given a peerage by Mr Major, had perverted the course of justice in his libel case, he would not have been allowed close enough to the centre of power for his driver to be entrusted with such a delicate task. For the broadcasters, this whole astonishing event was a plunge into the unknown. The sudden removal of a Prime Minister had never been practised. The noon deadline was absolute. Once that moment had passed, there could be no going back. Mrs Thatcher was out, Michael Heseltine stayed in, Mr Hurd and Mr Major quickly submitted their own applications. It would be a three-horse race. If anyone had planned this day, they would surely have concluded that having a prime ministerial resignation and three nominations for a renewed battle for the leadership would be quite enough. But this was only lunchtime. There would still be prime minister's questions in the Commons, as usual on a Thursday afternoon, and then a full-scale censure debate mounted by the opposition, which would also have to be answered by the prime minister. In more than 20 years reporting Parliament, I have never known such an extraordinary occasion. The Commons, with its rules and procedures, sometimes prides itself on appearing to be outside the immediate stream of events. But on this particular afternoon, trying to contain this explosive drama within the confines of a small debating chamber was simply not possible. The whole atmosphere was unreal. The Prime Minister was earnestly pretending that this was business as usual, but she had just lost a power struggle which had cost her career. Despite being so obviously divided, Conservative MPs tried to emphasise how united they were. Labour were desperate to claim some credit for removing the enemy, but knew the credit lay elsewhere. And those who had carried out the deed were not keen to draw attention to their success. In the view of Norman Tebbit, an enormous air of hypocrisy hung like a cloud over the Conservative benches. In many of their smiling, comfortable faces, he saw only traitors who were responsible for removing one of Britain's greatest Prime Ministers. I looked down from the press gallery and could hardly believe my good fortune at being able to witness such an event. It was a Northern Ireland MP, Martin Smith, who was called to ask the routine question about the Prime Minister's official engagements for that day. Mrs Thatcher's eyes were moist when she stood up at the dispatch box wearing a suit of the same shade of blue she had worn on her first day in Downing Street eleven years earlier. Without a glimmer of irony, she replied, This morning I chaired a meeting of the Cabinet. At 12.45pm I had an audience of Her Majesty the Queen. Later this afternoon I shall lead for the Government against the motion tabled in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Smith, true to the traditions of Northern Ireland politics, 
could not resist adding to his expression of sympathy a pointed remark. Ulster Unionists, he said, know what betrayal means. She did not respond, realising that even a detailed exposition of her government's policies towards Northern Ireland might not satisfy Mr Smith. Instead, she told him, she hoped to visit the province many times in the future, perhaps in a slightly different capacity. There were some emotional tributes. Her old friend from her days at Oxford, Dame Elaine Kellett Bowman, spoke of the love and affection of millions of people who over the years have looked to her with the greatest admiration and delight. Neil Kinnock conceded that she was at least worth more than those who had turned on her in recent days, but she was dismissive of his call for a general election. No, she replied firmly, no more than we had when Mr Wilson was replaced by Mr Callaghan. Mrs Thatcher's spirits began visibly to improve. The leader of the Liberal Democrats, Paddy Ashdown, generously described the courage, conviction and determination that she had brought to the office of Prime Minister. One of Mrs Thatcher's strengths had always been her ability to concentrate on the matter in hand. Her speech had been worked on the night before into the early hours of the morning. Those who prepared it, including Norman Tebbett, John Gummer, and her political secretary, John Whittingdale, were impressed at the way she pulled herself together and contributed to what amounted to a valedictory address. Mr Whittingdale sat among the seats in the Commons reserved for senior civil servants. He admitted to me that he had cried during Mrs Thatcher's speech. Our policies have brought unprecedented prosperity, she declared. We have been steady and staunch in defence and at the end of a long list of familiar achievements, these are the reasons we shall win a fourth election victory. The most memorable moment was a brief double act with the Labour MP Dennis Skinner. It had been suggested that when she left office, she would continue to fight against a single European currency run by an independent central bank. Mr Skinner interrupted, No, she's going to be the governor. Amidst laughter, Mrs Thatcher replied, What a good idea! I hadn't thought of that. She went on to explain that if she were the governor, there would not be a bank like that or a single currency. So I shall consider the proposal. She smiled broadly. Now where were we? I'm enjoying this. It was a bravura performance. The House of Commons rightly decided to allow Mrs Thatcher one last triumph at the dispatch box. At the end of the no-confidence debate, the government had a majority of 120. But the political world had been turned upside down. No one knew for sure who the next leader would be. The first opinion poll to be conducted showed the Tories ahead of Labour if Mr Heseltine took over. But to loyal Thatcherites, the idea that the arch-traitor should be rewarded with the post was just too awful to contemplate. Michael Heseltine might have expected to rejoice at Mrs Thatcher's decision to resign, but in one important respect he had been too successful. As he put it, to defeat her in open combat was one thing. To be held accountable for making her quit the field was quite another. A majority of Tory MPs were in no mood to forgive Mr Hesseltine for what he had done, and he was quick to sense that his best chance of leading the Conservative Party might well have passed. The news of Mrs Thatcher's decision was relayed to Mr Hesseltine as he was being driven to London Zoo to plant a tree for a children's organisation. This was typical of the hundreds of engagements he undertook. After walking out of the Cabinet, he had been conducting an unofficial campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Underpinning this extraordinary leadership campaign was Mr Hesseltine's considerable personal fortune. He would not have been able to leave the Cabinet in the way he did, he told me, if he had not been extremely wealthy. He had no compunction, for instance, about taking his official driver with him and buying a Jaguar which looked like the sort of car the government would provide for a cabinet minister. But on the morning of November the 22nd, 1990, despite all his efforts, it looked as if the top job was moving beyond his reach. Mr Hesseltine was relieved that his only official duty that morning was to plant a tree. Trees were one of his hobbies. At his country estate in Oxfordshire, he has an extensive arboretum, so he was able to carry out the task without being too distracted. It was Mr Hesseltine who coined the phrase, He who wields the knife never wears the crown. He knew that because he was the one person who had deliberately set out to remove Mrs Thatcher, loyal Tory MPs would do almost anything to stop him becoming Prime Minister, and so would Mrs Thatcher. <laughs>
What was particularly irritating for Mr. Hesseltine is that he tried so hard to disguise his opposition. The only open revolt since the Westland affair was over the poll tax, in which he backed his key ally, Michael Mates, who proposed that the tax should be banded. The Duke would pay more than the dustman. Mr. Hesseltine had also continued to make pro-European speeches, but he had avoided anything which might seem destructive or personal. After the years of self-discipline, his one act of standing openly against Mrs. Thatcher failed. The gamble had been lost. Thirteen years later, it would be Michael Howard who would give a textbook example of how the Conservative leadership game should be played. He remained loyal to Ian Duncan Smith until he resigned, and then he was able to pick up the crown without being accused of plotting. However, Mr. Hesseltine was fully geared up to fight the second ballot, and when Mrs. Thatcher announced she would not be standing, he believed he had no choice but to fight on. The two other candidates, the Chancellor John Major and the Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd, had both loyally backed Mrs. Thatcher, but now were free to campaign for themselves. The Thatcherites did not believe Douglas Hurd would beat Mr. Hesseltine, and so inevitably they began to look favourably on John Major. It was significant that Norman Tebbit was one of the first to join Mr. Major's campaign team. Mr. Hesseltine had hopes of convincing Cecil Parkinson. Mr. Parkinson had often told him that he should be Mrs. Thatcher's successor. But a phone call on the day of Mrs. Thatcher's resignation ended those hopes. People are saying, You have committed regicide, Mr. Parkinson told him. Mr. Hesseltine replied, Reggie who? But he could not laugh off the problem for long. Mr. Parkinson voted for Mr. Major. Mrs. Thatcher told the Cabinet that they should look for a successor from within their own ranks. The implication was clear. All the other members of the Cabinet went along with that decision, except for David Hunt, the Welsh Secretary, who was away in Tokyo at the time. Despite a personal call from Mrs. Thatcher, he came out in support of Mr. Hesseltine, and so did the former Cabinet Ministers, Mr. Lawson, Sir Geoffrey Howe and Lord Carrington. It was certainly heavyweight support, but not of the right kind. Mr. Hesseltine needed to gain votes from among those who had previously stayed loyal to Mrs. Thatcher. Mr. Hesseltine fought on in as cheerful a manner as he could muster. After Mrs. Thatcher's decision to go, the mood had lifted. Mr. Hesseltine wrote, It was as if the poison had been let out of the system. Each candidate expected to serve in each other's cabinet if he failed to win. From the beginning, Mr. Major had the advantage that he had played no part in Mrs. Thatcher's removal. Truth being often stranger than fiction, it is only fair to point out that Mr. Major went into hospital for an operation to deal with an abscess under a wisdom tooth three days before the result of the first ballot. He did not return to London until the morning Mrs. Thatcher announced her resignation. Mr. Major was, of course, kept closely in touch with what was happening, not least by his friend Geoffrey Archer but he specifically told his aides not to organise for a possible leadership campaign. As it turned out, this was by far the best tactic. In any case, Mr Major was not convinced that he should enter the contest. He recalls a last-minute conversation with Norman Lamont, who would become his campaign manager. Mr Major suggested Mr Hurd would be the best candidate. Mr Lamont shook his head vigorously. The door burst open, and a delegation of supporters poured in. They included Michael Howard, William Haig, John Gummer, David Davis, and Francis Maud. Mr Major says he was astounded. I'd heard my name was being talked about at Westminster, he wrote. I had no idea that I was likely to find such strong backing so quickly. The speed of the Major bandwagon certainly was surprising, but that he was one of the strong contenders for the leadership was never in doubt. In her memoirs, Mrs Thatcher makes clear that as soon as she knew who would be standing in the election to succeed her, she was ready to support Mr Major. She writes, There was one more duty I had to perform, and that was to ensure that John Major was my successor. I wanted, perhaps I needed to believe, that he was the man to secure and safeguard my legacy. Mrs Thatcher's comments were published in 1993, when it was already obvious that on key policies, including Europe, she had fallen out with her chosen successor. It is interesting she uses the phrase, perhaps I needed to believe. 
She is suggesting that she might have been wrong about Mr. Major, and provides the most convincing reason why she overlooked the fact that Mr. Major was quite a different kind of conservative from herself. Working on Mr. Major's behalf gave Mrs. Thatcher a comforting feeling that she was still at the helm, but her involvement was not entirely welcomed by those running the Major campaign. They had to answer Labour jibes that Mr. Major was son of Thatcher, and Mr. Major and his supporters were annoyed when she reinforced the impression that her departure would not lead to her retirement from frontline politics. The day before the second leadership ballot, she paid a farewell visit to Conservative Central Office. Surrounded by loyal party workers, she gave an emotional address. She mentioned that one of the first calls she received after her resignation was from President Bush. They discussed Saddam Hussein's occupation of Kuwait and the looming prospect of Allied action to remove the Iraqi forces. President Bush, she declared, won't falter, and I shan't falter. It's just that I shan't be pulling the levers there, but I shall be a very good backseat driver. Attempts were made by officials to suggest that her remarks had been misreported, but then the Independent revealed they had a full transcript. Mrs Thatcher, as the backseat driver of Mr Major's new government, was exactly the image her candidate was trying to avoid. It was, in any case, a strange use of this metaphor. To have someone in the back shouting comments about your driving is not normally regarded as particularly helpful. The next day, when the result was announced, all the anxieties in the Major camp fell away. Mr Major had won with 185 votes. Mr Hesseltine was on 131 Mr. Hurd trailed with 56 votes. Strictly speaking, Mr. Major was two votes short of an outright win, but the other candidates quickly conceded. The new leader had 19 votes less than the 204 votes Mrs. Thatcher had won in the first round, and it was interesting that Mr. Hesseltine's vote was 21 votes lower than his earlier score. He had been right to sense that his support was ebbing away. Mr Major later described the excitement at number 11 when the result was announced. Mrs Thatcher came through the connecting door from number 10. Well done, John, she enthused, well done. And then she went over to Mr Major's wife Norma and told her, it's what I've always wanted. With other journalists, I was waiting outside to hear Mr Major's response to his victory. Just before the door of number 11 was opened, Mrs Thatcher said, I'll come out. Mr Lamont took her to one side and said, please, let him have this moment. She stayed inside. Mr Major later claimed that he would have preferred to have gone into Downing Street with Mrs Thatcher, but she had her own way of capturing the attention of the media. She went upstairs, and with the lights on behind her, I could see her through the curtains. In her memoirs, Mrs Thatcher says, This was his night, not mine. She makes no mention of the fact that the most familiar image of that night was of her at a window looking down on her protégé as he made his first speech as party leader. The idea that she would indeed be a backseat driver was strongly reinforced. The most revealing picture of the next day also featured Mrs Thatcher as she left number 10 for the last time as Prime Minister. She managed to contain herself to make a final statement to the battery of microphones. Now is the time for a new chapter to open, she said, and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He will be splendidly served, and he has the makings of a great Prime Minister, which I'm sure he will be in a very short time. As she got into the car with Dennis, she could not hold back her tears. The abiding image of that day was of a deeply distressed Mrs Thatcher being driven away from the post she loved. Whenever John Major was discussed at the time of the leadership election, it was almost inevitable that he would be described as nice. As I prepared a profile of him for Radio 4's Today programme, I tried to limit the number of times this point was made. Not because it wasn't true, but because it soon became a cliché. It also said very little about what sort of Prime Minister he might become. Mr Major maintains that his platform in the leadership election was not designed to appeal to the Thatcherites. He would press for social reform, tax cuts for the less well-off, and improved public services. We must help the disadvantaged, he wrote in The Sun. It was not, he comments, a clarion call to the right of the party.
he faced one of the most common problems in politics, how to promote a mood for change while giving the impression that continuity would be preserved as well. A good deal of vagueness on exactly where he stood was the inevitable result. On Europe, he argued the party should favour gradualism, practicalism and common sense, whatever that might mean. On the poll tax, he promised a full-scale review, but would not commit himself to outright abolition. All he would say was that he was increasingly convinced that we cannot leave things as they are. His policy commitments were kept to a minimum. The key point for all his supporters was that the opinion polls suggested that he had a good chance of being able to beat Neo Kinnock at the next election, certainly a better chance than if Mrs Thatcher had remained leader. The day before the second leadership ballot, she paid a farewell visit to Conservative Central Office. Surrounded by loyal party workers, she gave an emotional address. She mentioned that one of the first calls she received after her resignation was from President Bush. They discussed Saddam Hussein's occupation of Kuwait and the looming prospect of Allied action to remove the Iraqi forces. President Bush, she declared, won't falter and I shan't falter. It's just that I shan't be pulling the levers there, but I shall be a very good backseat driver. Attempts were made by officials to suggest that her remarks had been misreported, but then the Independent revealed they had a full transcript. Mrs Thatcher, as the backseat driver of Mr Major's new government, was exactly the image her candidate was trying to avoid. It was, in any case, a strange use of this metaphor. To have someone in the back shouting comments about your driving is not normally regarded as particularly helpful. The next day, when the result was announced, all the anxieties in the Major camp fell away. Mr Major had won with 185 votes. Mr Hesseltine was on 131 Mr. Hurd trailed with 56 votes. Strictly speaking, Mr. Major was two votes short of an outright win, but the other candidates quickly conceded. The new leader had 19 votes less than the 204 votes Mrs. Thatcher had won in the first round, and it was interesting that Mr. Hesseltine's vote was 21 votes lower than his earlier score. He had been right to sense that his support was ebbing away. Mr Major later described the excitement at number 11 when the result was announced. Mrs Thatcher came through the connecting door from number 10. Well done, John, she enthused, well done. And then she went over to Mr Major's wife Norma and told her, it's what I've always wanted. With other journalists, I was waiting outside to hear Mr Major's response to his victory. Just before the door of number 11 was opened, Mrs Thatcher said, I'll come out. Mr Lamont took her to one side and said, please, let him have this moment. She stayed inside. Mr Major later claimed that he would have preferred to have gone into Downing Street with Mrs Thatcher, but she had her own way of capturing the attention of the media. She went upstairs, and with the lights on behind her, I could see her through the curtains. In her memoirs, Mrs Thatcher says, This was his night, not mine. She makes no mention of the fact that the most familiar image of that night was of her at a window looking down on her protégé as he made his first speech as party leader. The idea that she would indeed be a backseat driver was strongly reinforced. The most revealing picture of the next day also featured Mrs Thatcher as she left number 10 for the last time as Prime Minister. She managed to contain herself to make a final statement to the battery of microphones. Now is the time for a new chapter to open, she said, and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He will be splendidly served, and he has the makings of a great Prime Minister, which I'm sure he will be in a very short time. As she got into the car with Dennis, she could not hold back her tears. The abiding image of that day was of a deeply distressed Mrs Thatcher being driven away from the post she loved. Whenever John Major was discussed at the time of the leadership election, it was almost inevitable that he would be described as nice, as I prepared a profile of him for Radio 4's Today programme, I tried to limit the number of times this point was made, not because it wasn't true, but because it soon became a cliché. It also said very little about what sort of Prime Minister he might become. Mr Major maintains that his platform in the leadership election was not designed to appeal to the Thatcherites. He would press for social reform, tax cuts for the less well-off, 
and improved public services. We must help the disadvantaged, he wrote in The Sun. It was not, he comments, a clarion call to the right of the party. He faced one of the most common problems in politics, how to promote a mood for change while giving the impression that continuity would be preserved as well. A good deal of vagueness on exactly where he stood was the inevitable result. On Europe, he argued the party should favour gradualism, practicalism and common sense, whatever that might mean. On the poll tax, he promised a full-scale review, but would not commit himself to outright abolition. All he would say was that he was increasingly convinced that we cannot leave things as they are. His policy commitments were kept to a minimum. The key point for all his supporters was that the opinion polls suggested that he had a good chance of being able to beat Neil Kinnock at the next election, certainly a better chance than if Mrs Thatcher had remained leader. Mr Major did have an image problem. He seemed a rather dull fellow. He wore spectacles, his hair was grey, his face was pale, his voice was undistinguished, and his suits were boring. This was not entirely to his disadvantage. After eleven years of Mrs Thatcher, there was a definite yearning for a different kind of Prime Minister. With the relentless exposure of the modern media, people become bored with charismatic characters. Conservative MPs, keen on the new leadership, felt that the best of the Thatcher period could be preserved without the excesses. There would be less drama and more common sense. The government would be closer to the people. A former minister told me recently he had strongly welcomed the prospect of change. He was not concerned that Mr Major had not worked out a clear philosophy for government. He thought it would be like getting someone to clear up the mess on a building site. All the difficult design and construction work had been completed. It just needed a competent foreman to bring it up to scratch. Mr Major's strongest card was his remarkable personal story. From a family with an invalid father living in two cramped rented rooms in Brixton to the pinnacle of government at number 10 was no distance in terms of miles. In practice, it was an extraordinary achievement. To do this from within the Labour Party would have been difficult enough but for a Conservative Party leader to be able to say that he had left school at 16 and who did not seem to know how many O-levels he had was a source of wonder. When Mr Major talked of the need for Britain to be a classless society, it carried a great deal of conviction. Mrs Thatcher's biographer, Hugo Young, was not an obvious fan. He complained in The Guardian that Mr Major's speech extolling the virtues of capitalism was without the vestige of an original idea but Mr Young perceptively summed up his prospects. The modern Tory party relates to him with a comfort that will grow. Those who looked into Mr Major's background to try to find out why he had not become a socialist concluded that his father's influence, his preference for individual rather than collective action, and his determination to get out of poverty were all factors which drew him to the Conservatives. To him, one of the great strengths of the Conservative Party was that it appeared to provide a way up in class terms. It was not only an advantage to meet people in the party who might be helpful to your career, it also demonstrated to anyone else that you were the kind of person who wanted to climb the ladder. Much of Mr Major's success was due to his skill with people, and much of the new Prime Minister's social skills may have come from his mother. Gwen had a straightforward philosophy, he wrote. Share what you have got. Be polite to others. Think of their feelings. Make allowances for them. Stand up for yourself, but don't cause unnecessary offence. Don't show your own feelings. Unfortunately, neither of Mr Major's parents lived long enough to see him become an MP, let alone Prime Minister. Mr Major's rise to power at Westminster started in a solid, unspectacular way. He was a parliamentary private secretary, then joined the Whip's office. It was when he had become a senior Whip that at a dinner at number 10, Mr Major passed a vital test with a woman who would become his most important patron. Invited to give his views on Conservative backbench opinion, he had been devastatingly frank. They don't like our policies, he told the Prime Minister. They're worried that capital expenditure is being sacrificed to current spending. When Mrs Thatcher made clear 
She did not like this message. He stuck to his guns. The temperature rose. He was shaking with anger and nearly walked out, but it soon became apparent that not all was lost. Dennis Thatcher came up to him afterwards and said, She'll have enjoyed that. The next day Mrs Thatcher had a friendly chat with him in the Commons, and a few weeks later he was given his first ministerial post as a junior minister in the Department of Social Security. Various dates have been suggested for when Mrs Thatcher decided that he might be her successor, but there is no doubt that his appointment to succeed Sir Geoffrey Howe as Foreign Secretary was the crucial turning point. A smiling Mrs Thatcher bestowed the surprising honour at her office at number 10. Aren't there others better qualified, Mr Major asked. She waved her hand dismissively. Even as he rose to the very top, Mr Major was constantly being underestimated. It happens so often it is tempting to see this as one of the clues to his success. How was it that he triumphed while other far cleverer politicians failed? Part of the answer must have been that he did not appear threatening. Those who could help him did not sense the driving ambition, the iron determination behind the smile. When people felt his hand on their back, they did not imagine that it held a dagger. His mother had taught him, stand up for yourself, but don't cause unnecessary offence. Don't show your own feelings. Well, it worked for John Major, and for a time it looked as though he might be the answer to his party's prayers. The idea that Mrs Thatcher could have returned to the government to serve as a cabinet minister under John Major never seemed remotely likely. But to the annoyance of the Thatcherites, every effort was made to see that Michael Heseltine was given a job he wanted. He was first offered the Home Office, but he declined, and then Mr Major thought of a move which a chess player would appreciate. During the leadership campaign, Mr Heseltine had promised to replace the deeply unfair poll tax with a fairer tax. Well, let him devise one, and if people thought the environment job, which included the poll tax, was less like the Queen on a chessboard and more like a poisoned chalice, let him see if he could refuse. Mr Major decided that Mr Heseltine should be the new environment secretary, and he accepted the challenge with a smile and a handshake for the cameras in Downing Street. The new Home Secretary was Kenneth Baker, and the easiest decision for Mr Major was to leave the third leadership candidate, Douglas Hurd, at the Foreign Office. He seemed born for the part. He looked and behaved like a Foreign Secretary, and his early career had been with the diplomatic service, and Mr Hurd was confident of having a much closer and friendlier relationship with Mr Major than he had managed with Mrs Thatcher. With Mr Hasseltine and Mr Hurd in top jobs, Kenneth Clark appointed Education Secretary, and Chris Patton as party chairman, the pro-Europeans had done well. Deciding who should replace himself as Chancellor of the Exchequer was not so easy. The appointment of Norman Lamont, Mr Major's campaign manager, was seen by some as simply the quid pro quo. There were doubts about his political skills, but Mr Lamont had long ministerial experience in the Treasury, and he was well known to the financial markets. The decision to join the ERM, made by Mrs Thatcher on Mr Major's advice, would give the new Chancellor far less room for manoeuvre than in the past. From now on, the overriding aim would be to try to maintain the value of the pound within the system. There is more than a touch of irony in the fact that the Chancellor responsible for this policy never had much faith in the ideas behind it. For Mr Lamont to complain, even in private, about the constraints of ERM membership would not have been easy. It was regarded by Mr Major as his most impressive achievement in government. Mr Hurd and Mr Heseltine were fully signed up, and it was in the area of European policy that Mr Major was hoping to execute a rapid shift towards a more constructive outlook. Mr Major's European honeymoon began easily in Rome, with the other leaders genuinely relieved that, as they saw it, the obstacle to progress in the shape of Mrs Thatcher had at last been removed. The summit itself was something of an anticlimax. I sent a message to Mr Major saying I would be seeking his reaction after his first meeting with his new colleagues, but when I thrust my microphone in front of him, all he could manage was, it's been a very interesting morning. Back in the Commons, when he reported on the summit, Mr Major's tone was markedly different from Mrs Thatcher's bristling antagonism of the month before. 
whereas she had stressed the negative, he was more inclined to say, maybe. I used a split-screen technique to illustrate the point on the six o'clock news. First Mrs Thatcher on one side, and then fading to Mr Major on the other. The contrast was stark, and it annoyed the Labour Party. The head of Mr Kinnock's office, Charles Clark, was livid. It was, he insisted, poor journalism. Labour's concern became increasingly obvious. If Mr Major represented change, where did that leave their leader, Neil Kinnock? The election was at most only 18 months away. Mr Major was keen to maintain a relaxed relationship with the press. It would not last for long, and we enjoyed it while we could. In policy terms, he was in a more difficult position than those Prime Ministers who are appointed following a general election. Mrs Thatcher, in 1979, had worked out the main changes she wanted to introduce. Mr Major had to get going from a standing start. The biggest problem was the poll tax. Mr Hesseltine had to find an alternative system, preferably before the election. Much depended on whether the relationship between Mr Major and Mr Hesseltine could stand the strain. They had never been close, and John Wakeham, who had kept his old job as Energy Secretary, described to me how he acted as a go-between. Instead of the two men simply working together, it seems they required Mr Wakeham to make sure that the final deal was acceptable to both of them. The negotiations were eventually successful. The replacement for the poll tax would be called the council tax, a property tax not very different from the old rating system. After the main details had been agreed, Mr Wakeham followed Mr Hesseltine out of the cabinet room and into Downing Street. I said to him, he told me, I'm coming with you. We don't want a message going round the world that you've walked out again. Mr Wakeham told me that eventually they all realised that Mr Hesseltine was 100% loyal to Mr Major, but we didn't know that at the time. The Thatcherites were convinced that the pro-Europeans, particularly Mr Hesseltine, effectively had a veto in all the key decisions made by John Major. They did not regard his cabinet as balanced in the way that Mr Major did. In the light of future developments, it is interesting to see how at this stage it looked as though the Eurosceptics had been defeated. Mr Hesseltine's return to the cabinet caused concern and even some anger among many Conservatives. Mrs Thatcher and her close allies would never be reconciled to his political comeback. As if the political struggle at home was not enough, Mr Major now had to contemplate the prospect of a war in the Middle East. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 1990, the Western response was swift. The invasion was seen as a threat to oil supplies, as well as a deliberate attempt to upset the balance of power in the region. And within days, the first steps were made in building a military coalition to take on Saddam Hussein. Mrs Thatcher had heard the news while attending a conference with President Bush at Aspen in Colorado. For her, it was an opportunity to relive some of the excitement of the Falklands campaign. She felt her wide experience in office and her friendship with many world leaders could be brought dramatically into play. At one stage, she even suggested to President Bush that he should not go wobbly. She enjoyed the contrast between her complete certainty and his more questioning approach. Mr Major's task was to continue planning on the probability that war would take place soon after the UN deadline of January the 15th had passed. Mr Bush phoned Mr Major before making the announcement. He told Mr Major he was not going wobbly, making clear that Mrs Thatcher's remark had not been forgotten and maybe not entirely forgiven either. The coalition against Saddam Hussein held together surprisingly well. Within a few days of the start of the ground attack, on 24th of February 1991, the Iraqis had been driven out and a ceasefire was called. The completion of the Gulf War left Mrs Thatcher acutely aware of her changed circumstances. Having taken part in all the main decisions at the beginning of the crisis, it was frustrating for her to be left on the sidelines. When her memoirs were published, she gave a succinct reason why this had not been possible. She wrote, I was not allowed by the Conservative Party to see through the campaign to throw Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. How would she maximise her influence in future, and what steps would she take to make her presence felt? These were matters which increasingly weighed on her mind.
When Mrs. Thatcher returned to the real world, she found it difficult. Like the rest of us, she had to grapple with the mundane tasks of ordinary life, and in particular the problem of how to find a plumber on a Sunday. Mrs. Thatcher's answer was to ring her former private secretary, Charles Pole, who had stayed on to work for Mr. Major. Mr. Pole, who in the past would have led her through the intricacies of world politics, thought for a moment, and then came to the unsurprising conclusion that the best method would be to look in the yellow pages. He told me the story as a way of describing the shock to Mrs. Thatcher of leaving Downing Street. Mrs. Thatcher might even have found looking through the yellow pages a strange and tedious chore, but fortunately Mr. Poe was able to help. He leafed through a copy. So, here's a number, he said. Ring this guy, and I'm sure he'll come round and fix the problem. An hour or so later, Mrs. Thatcher phoned back to say that the job had been done. She was startled, though, at the price. Mr. Pole assured her that exorbitant fees from emergency plumbers had become the norm. He might have added that this was one of the more striking changes of her period in office. The plumbing problem occurred in a luxury flat the Thatchers had been lent in Eaton Square by an admirer, the widow of the American industrialist Henry Ford. They had not met Mrs. Ford before. She told Mrs. Thatcher, I come to London for a couple of days a year. You are the greatest Prime Minister of Britain that there has ever been, and it would be such an honour if you stayed in my flat. The next summer they moved to a house not far away in Chester Square. The security arranged by the police provided at least a level of continuity. Ever since the Brighton bomb she had been very closely guarded. I suggested to John Whittingdale, her political secretary, who left Downing Street to continue working for her, that it must have been difficult for her to do any shopping. She didn't shop, he replied. They wouldn't let her go down to Tesco's. Dennis had a little more freedom, but for her to go anywhere was a major undertaking, just as it had been when she was Prime Minister. End of Disc 3